Football is about to fire back up in preparation for the spring. Let's talk about what the new starting lineup can look like on offense and take a look at the new additions from the portal and the high school ranks. Ian A. Boyd is stopping by to talk about the upgraded scheme and the offensive players who can make a difference for us. Make sure to head over to Inside Texas to stay up to date on everything UT. So, go on. Sign up at Inside Texas today. And as always, don't forget to pick up your new hat for the new season from Last Stand Hats. Use promo code TEXASHOMER, all caps, for 10% off your purchase at laststandhats.com. Let's talk the new offense and the players that could be the next wave of starters for the Longhorns. Without further ado, let's get into it. What's up, Ian? Welcome back. I always enjoy talking scheme and then the personnel to fit that scheme with you. Let's start with quarterbacks. First, Quinn received perfect rankings and very high praise in high school. So what does Quinn bring to the table for the Longhorns? Quinn Ewers is one of the best deep ball passing prospects we've ever seen. If you look at his uh, recruiting ranking listings, they have him listed as like a perfect uh, 100% or, you know, whatever the 100 grade, like no flaws. Um, that seems like, that's, that seems like a bit much, but uh, he is an amazing deep ball thrower. He can throw on the move. He can throw from multiple arm slots. Um, he throw off his back foot and throw deep sometimes at South Lake Carroll, just not ideal, but um, sometimes it was very helpful because he's pressured and then he's still off his back foot, chucking it over everybody's head. So that's what he brings. He brings high level deep ball throwing to an offense that really, really wants to take it, the ball deep and throw it over everyone's head to Xavier Worthy. So in that sense, match made in heaven. What impressed me with his tape is his anticipation, a really good mental map of the field and where receivers should be. And like you said, he would get significant pressure, take that good step and deliver the ball to a crossing route before the window was even open. So does anticipation also help set him apart? Yeah, he would throw um, he would throw in into anticipated windows. They were good at throwing comebacks at South Lake Carroll. So, you know, he's throwing to spots, uh, anticipating that his guy's going to come back and get it. And he'd hit those with pretty good timing. So it's not just that he has a, a cannon arm and can throw from multiple slots. He's actually got some developed skill in throwing it deep. A lot of times these uh, big armed high school kids, you watch them in high school and they just wait for it to come open. And then they see it open and then they throw it um, and they can get away with it because their arm is so big. You watch like, a, you know, Colt McCoy or Drew Brees. What made those guys transcendent is that they could almost never do that at any level. So they had to throw it open. And eventually somebody will force you to throw it open and not just wait. And um, that's when the big arm guys tend to struggle. But yours, he throws with anticipation a lot of times as though he were a three-star kind of arm instead of a five-star arm. And Quinn hasn't got a live meaningful rep in a little over a year. And we have Hudson Card developing as well. And Card also has a big arm and he also has a year jump in the system. So is yours a shoe in as fans tend to think, or do you anticipate a strong QB battle between the two? I think we'll definitely see a battle. I don't think they want to give it to yours. I think they want him to have to earn it. It would not be surprising if they expected or wanted Ewers to win the job just because he's so talented. A lot of hype. You can see him. Texas is already hyping him up a little bit here and there. You know, you sell more season tickets with Queen Ewers, right? But um, I, I anticipate a real battle, and I'm not even totally sure how I think it'll shake out. I kind of want to see some early returns before I try to make a prediction. Yeah, the proof will be in the pudding during the spring game, so really no point in guessing. We'll get to find out soon enough. And it'll help to see reps from both of them in the simulated game setting, at least. And Malik Murphy is also in the mix with a lot of tools and should be fun to watch his growth. Do you think having Murphy will help push Card and yours? Well, I think down the road, it's good that he's in there. Like in like three years, probably neither Card nor yours are there. And then you'll have Murphy and whoever they recruit. You know, obviously they're hoping that's Arch. But if it's not, uh, you're really going to want to have guys that have been developed um and sark has had a history of uh sometimes his best quarterbacks are the guys that are guys that he developed over multiple years in a system and that weren't ready until they were upperclassmen so that's what i anticipate from murphy i really don't think he's gonna 
have an impact on the field in 2022 unless something goes just terribly, terribly wrong. If you watch him at, um, at Gina Percera, his high school, I mean, they didn't even always ask a lot of him in their offense. They were, you know, handing the ball off a lot, playing bigger personnel. So he is not at all used to carrying a heavy load for a competitive team at any level, much less Texas, Big 12, or SEC. So I, I really don't think we're going to see him for a while. But I think he was a good pickup for the future. And running back is a no-brainer. Bajan is the starter. Then we have Roshan, Keelan Robinson, and Jonathan Brooks, who I'm really excited about. With the talent in the room, do you think we see more two-back formations, potentially go-go-inspired stuff with the addition of Brennan Marion? You really wonder. Um, they could have hired a lot of promising wide receiver coaches, I think, and they hired Marion. Is it because of his skills as a recruiter? Is it because of uh, – you know, his work at Pitt with the Blitnikoff winner, or is it also because of this fact that he has this uh, scheme in this whole complete offensive philosophy that he's been shelving to work as a position coach and kind of climb the coaching ladder. Um, so just the fact that Texas has so many running backs and then they specifically hire a wide receiver coach with a background using a multi running back offense is definitely suspicious. You could say, um, but they didn't run the go-go at Pitt last year. I, I looked and I couldn't find any go-go formations or snaps from them from what I saw. So I don't know if uh, it's going to be a big part of the offense or not, but it's not hard to connect the dots and wonder at the very least. Yeah, Pitt didn't utilize it. Last stop that was full go-go offense was William and Mary. I do hope we merge some of those principles into Sark's scheme. Do you think we see an increase in Keelan's presence on the field? Because that speed is really hard to defend against. And, uh, only if they make uh, go-go formations with two running backs a really big part of the offense. That has to be consistent, or else I just don't think we're going to see a ton of Keelan. They're going to want Bijan to touch the ball 20, 25 times every game, at least. Rashawn Johnson, obviously has earned more snaps and Rashawn has a specific skill set in that he's just such a powerful, tough, short yardage guy. Um, they installed that wildcat stuff for him and built on it for the Kansas state game when they had nothing else. And he was just exemplary in it. No big shock. That was basically the Port Nash's Groves off since, but I mean, that's just a lot of mouths to feed. So unless there's an injury, I don't know that we're going to see a lot more Keelan uh, unless they're really just planning on having, you know, hundreds of carries to go around with uh, extra two-back formations. And wide receiver has a far better outlook with Worthy and then also the addition of Isaiah Nayor out of Wyoming. And are those the de facto number one and number two receivers right there? I think so. I think so. Jordan Whittington is uh, still a pretty good player. Jordan Whittington, I think uh, definitely in the slot, we'll see him when they use formations with the slot that isn't Jaleel Billingsley. Um, I think he can play X or Z as well. So maybe we'll see Whittington just kind of as a utility guy who plays all the positions and ends up getting starter snaps. Maybe he's better than Nayor in year one, but you'd probably lean towards Worthy and Nayor's one and two. I was most impressed by Nayor's jump ball ability, and he makes acrobatic catches consistently. And then thinking about this third spot at wide receiver, Whittington is solid with possessions, good on third down. Those quick, short, must-catch type of plays can be provided by him, but you covered him already. So what do you think of the newer guys like Jaden Alexis and incoming freshman Brennan Thompson? Both provide the speed that Sark requires. Alexis is uh, really talented, really fast. He kind of seems like the guy that could be what Xavier Worthy is, you know, probably not to that level, but he seems like the kind of talent that, in the, that Sark would probably like to hone into a uh, big outside play action target. So I, I kind of think he'll be on the slow burner developing and waiting his turn while Worthy does his thing is my, my expectation right now. And then Brandon Thompson, Sort of the same. He's got such game-changing speed. You feel like you might see him sooner than later. You know, we all watched, I imagine, we all watched Tyreek Hill for the Chiefs the other night against the, the Bills. 
But just when you have someone that fast with like, you know, 10 flat type uh, track speed on the field, it just makes such a huge difference. So Brandon Thompson, might we see him early? Maybe. Um, but he's also got a ways to go in terms of translating track speed into actual football skill. I, I think the world of him, I think he's going to be really good, but I don't know if he's going to have a huge impact or not in year one as a, you know, regular rotation guy. It's just kind of a crowded room now that they have Nayor and they still have Whittington. And at tight end, we lost Brewer and Wiley, but we did gain Jaleel Billingsley from Alabama after a weird season with some awkward Saban pressers, but with a change of scenery, what does Jaleel bring to the tight end position and to the offense? I think an important thing with Alabama is that they leaned more into drop back passing this year with uh, Bill O'Brien and Bryce Young. So they were not quite as much of an RPO play action team as they were with like Mac Jones and Tonga Vailoa under Sarkeesian. Um, and then they had Slade Bolden in the slot. He was really good, really reliable, and they wanted to play him a lot so that Young would have that many more targets. So it wasn't kind of a different offense a little bit for Alabama. They don't change too much too fast under Nick Saban, but they do evolve from year to year. And I think that was a big evolution that sort of left him out a little bit because when you're at 11 personnel, the tight end has to block. Jaleel Billingsley, when I watched, not as bad a blocker as I was expecting, but not a great blocker, not a, not an 11 personnel primary box, uh, you know, adjunct to the offensive line kind of guy. And Cameron Latu was. Um, so Latu, or however you pronounce that name, sorry, Cameron, he got a lot of snaps uh, instead of Billingsley, and Billingsley would play in 12 personnel, or he would play in 11 personnel when they wanted to throw. And you can see all the talent is still there. He's running great routes. Um, he's almost like a um, – he reminds me a little of little Jordan Humphrey uh, in that he's like a big, tight end-shaped kind of guy, but more of a receiver. He's a better blocker than Humphrey, um, probably not as quick and twitchy running little option routes underneath, but maybe better long speed um, going down the field than Humphrey. So I think probably they'll play kind of like Texas did in 2018 where they have a box tight end that's doing the real blocking. And then the uh, move tight end, last year was Kate Brewer and he did a lot of blocking too. I think they'll change that position this year to where it's much more flexed out running routes like Humphrey and um, that'll be Billingsley. They probably play, I think they'll play a lot of 12 personnel with him. He's a, he's a tremendous talent. And when we're talking 11 personnel, meaning one tight end on the field, do we likely see more Gunner Helm due to his blocking ability? Yeah. Helm Hammerhand, that guy, pretty good blocker last year as a freshman. Uh, you, you can go find his sporadic snaps last year and uh, he's a little skinny. He's like uh 6'5", 235 maybe last year. And he's out there scrapping and drive blocking as hard as he can and pretty effectively. Um, there's some thought that he was going to replace Jared Wiley one way or the other this year just because he's better for that role. Hence Wiley, you know, looking for greener pastures. And boy, did he ever find it. That, him and Sonny Dykes is a great fit. But uh, yeah, helm hammer hand. Best, probably the best blocking tight end on the team chance to gain more weight and strength this off season. I think we're going to see him a lot. Um, you know, when they want to play 11 personnel and just throw the ball, just slide Billingsley inside. He's definitely a good enough blocker to do that. But when they really want to run the ball um, or they want to run RPOs where the tight end is blocking, I think we'll see a lot of helm. And we have a couple more names of note. First, I'm a fan of Juan Davis and his positional versatility. He can serve several roles and he's effective after the catch as well. Do you think we will see more of Juan this upcoming season? Mm -hmm. I think we probably would have seen him more if they hadn't picked up Billingsley. Um, he's a solid blocker, it looks like. Uh, I think he can grow into being the kind of blocker that Cade Brewer was last year. And then he offers more um, in the receiving role that Cade Brewer played last year than, than Brewer would, I think. He's got... He still has his quickness. Brewer lost a lot of his quickness over the course of time at Texas because of knee injuries and gaining weight. So I, I think he's going to be sort of a slow burn, um, talented athlete, but just has to add a few more skills here and there and blocking and receiving and a few more uh, bits of muscle here and there and bits of strength. And then he'll end up being a regular 
component to the offense. But in the meantime, probably, you know, special teams back up, come in and plow a road for Jonathan Brooks and they get up big on teams from throwing over their heads to worthy, that kind of role. And as you know, the fans will have us arrested if we don't mention Jatavion Sanders. Fans are asking about him all the time. I hear questions often. And we aren't seeing him at the rate most assumed. So where is Jatavion, and do you think we can get him some more meaningful reps this season? It's probably in his court right now. He's not the blocker that Helm Hammerhand is, so you're not going to see him over Helm. They have to have somebody that is a reliable, versatile blocker. That's an easy role to get a lot of snaps if you're tight end, and that's not going to be it. Um, great receiver. Hear great things about his receiving skill at Texas so far. But they just added Billingsley from uh, you know, the national championship runner-up team. So it's going to be kind of tough to beat out Billingsley uh, for the receiving tight end spot. So then you're looking at, you know, is he going to be next in line for backup snaps where he's got to compete with Juan Davis, who has a similar profile? Um, or maybe they create a, a, a 13 personnel package kit, three tight ends on the field, and uh, let Billingsley and Jatavion hunt matchups outside as pure receivers. Could see that. Um, it's just one of those things, though, where it's like everybody wants to see more of Keelan Robinson. Everyone wants to see more of Rashawn. Uh, everyone's going to want to see Nayor and Whittington and Worthy on the field. They can package all these guys' roles, but it's never going to be. You're always going to be left wanting more, which is, you know, that's a good sign if that's what happens. Yeah, there's only five skill players that can be on the field at once, so it's always going to be kind of tricky and a balance there. And now let's talk about the much-anticipated offensive line. It seems the coaches are more focused on the incoming freshmen opposed to the transfer portal, so are we not looking for transfer O-line additions? Uh, they might. They have one. I've, I've heard that they have one guy from a big-time program that might come, um, probably sort of a hunt for playing time kind of situation. I don't know if this player would start or play or if they'd just be like another reliable veteran in a room that'll have a ton of young guys. And with developing the new guys, we only have one early enrollee, leading me to believe we will see a similar O-line group as last year. But which freshmen do you think have a chance to get on the two deep early or even potentially start during the season? I think um, obviously Kelvin Banks will be coming in to fight for a starting job. They're going to come out of the spring with a ton of reps for Christian Jones and Andre Karich. So those two guys, I mean, I think fans need to brace themselves for the possibility that those two guys lock down the starting tackle jobs and that the, you know, the dream revitalization of the offensive line from all the incoming five stars uh, doesn't happen immediately. As those two guys are both, you know, you don't want to write them off yet. And, uh, they get the spring now to try to cement their spots, but definitely those two guys, they need to be, uh, they need to have like a, I need to outrun this other camper so that the bear doesn't catch me in the fall mindset. Cause whoever finishes second between Jones and carriage is definitely vulnerable to banks. I think maybe a Cameron Williams too. Like normally a huge guy like that. You're like, well, he has to be in good shape. Okay. He should get in better shape, but he's an enormous human being. Like, it's not like he has to gain 30 pounds to be able to fight off college players, right? If he's got to lose 30 pounds. Um, and then also a guy like that, you're like, well, if we can teach him to kick step, you know, he could really be something. But that's like, he looks more comfortable going backwards than going forward sometimes. I think that this is Duncanville's Cameron Williams. I think he's pretty underrated. Don't be shocked if he is in the rotation early. And then, um, Obviously, uh, Campbell, if he comes to Texas, is just an unreal talent, unreal athlete. I think he would fit uh, behind Junior Angelau and Hayden Connor at guard and probably only start if uh, somebody gets hurt, would be my guess. I think both of those guys are actually going to be really good this year. So even someone as talented as him, I don't think he's going to beat them out in year one. But if anyone hurts, it's like just count on seeing Campbell if he comes. Uh, man, there's like three other guys that may be worth mentioning too. I don't know. 
they, they're all really talented. It, they're going to be all across the two deep. So we'll see them either in garbage time or getting rotation snaps, or if anybody gets hurt, we're going to end up seeing, I would guess, at least two of these guys play regularly. Fans should also update their view on the offensive line because early on it was straight up scary, 100%, but they did improve throughout the season, and you can verify that statistically. People tend to be so scared by the Arkansas game, they think that the line was that bad the entire year, but they definitely improved with time together and Flood's development. So even if we do see the same or very similar line, it's not necessarily cause for panic like the beginning of last year. Yeah. An offensive line is so much a uh, five guys on the same page deal. It's like sometimes when you're having problems on the line, the solution is not, oh, we need better athletes in there. It's just all five guys need to know how to block and they need to all be on the same page and communicating well. Uh, The best offensive line in the Big 12 last year and maybe in next year was Baylor and Baylor had like, you know, some two-star transfers and some like elder statesmen. They had like maybe their tackles were probably the only guys that are like, these are major obvious talents. Uh, They're like low four-star, high three-star kind of guys. The rest of it was just good coaching, chemistry, right mindset, four years of grown man strength and their strength and conditioning, you know, that, that, that line will beat the uber-talented freshmen. Maybe not the uber-talented sophomores in 2023, but the uber-talented freshmen in 2022, probably not it. And then let's zoom out a bit, man. How does the offense improve with our current players' development as well as all the new additions? When I look at this group right now, I see two quarterbacks that can throw the ball down the field. Um, Card, I know, didn't really – didn't seem like he was totally putting it together until West Virginia and then – you know, cheap shot out, but um, he has that potential. Obviously yours has that potential. I see a team with a really smart center, scrappy guy who's really coming into his own flanked by two massive guards who played well last year, the best running back in the country and Bijan Robinson, and now two deep threats outside. So you have Worthy, who was already probably the best deep threat in the big 12, could be one of the best vertical wide receivers in the country next year. And then Naor, who's really, you know, the two things that everyone notices on his film are that he'll go up and get the ball in the end zone. And um, he runs great double moves. A lot of those touchdowns he's scoring, he's throwing a double move. Sark loves, loves, loves to throw play action, double move, motion his speedy guy one spot, and then have the guy backside who's like Naor run a double move and be wide open on a post against your worst corner one-on-one. Um so I think we're going to see Texas do a, a better version of what they tried last year, which is a lot of pounding the ball um, and then a lot of play action, just chuck it over your head. So with that in mind, it's, it's, it's just about which personnel packages best set up the run game and then make it easy to set up the shots. Um, so I think we'll see probably a lot more helm then uh, maybe some of these other guys that are talented that people want to see, like uh, Sanders, Rashawn, Keelan, whoever it is. Um, and then there will just be kind of a rotation on the inside of who's playing slot or who's playing extra tight end or who's playing extra running back. They, they may just mix it up based on opponent. But I think at the end of the day, it's going to be power downhill behind the interior line and then chuck it over their heads. And if we had to do a way too early 11 personnel offensive lineup. Who do you think would be the starters? Well, uh, Billingsley blurs the line so much. So uh, I'll, I'll say X, Neor, Z, Worthy, H, Whittington, or Billingsley, Y, Helm. I'm not going to make a prediction on quarterback yet. Uh, Bijan, obviously, lots of snaps for Rashawn. And then for now, I'll say Jones, Ungalau, Majors, Connor, Karich. And then I'm not definitely not ruling out banks or somebody starting a tackle in the fall, but I'm also not ruling out Jones or in carriage uh, locking that down as well. Good stuff, man. Starting to see it come together early on. I appreciate you stopping by and please let the viewers know where to track down your work. You guys find me on Twitter at Ian underscore a underscore Boyd. 
uh, check out Flyover Football on Inside Texas, where I'm doing the same kind of analysis for the rest of the Big 12. Probably talk about some national teams as well here pretty soon. Um, you know, who looks good for next year, who I think has a chance to win a title. And then you got to be checking out Inside Texas for recruiting news, inside scoop, schematic analysis, all this stuff. We have just a heavyweight lineup right now cranking out content. So get in there. And that is a wrap on ENA Boyd. And make sure to go sign up at Inside Texas, content being dropped daily, and a hilarious board to interact with your fellow fans. Thanks for hanging out. Watch some more of my videos here. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you want to support quality Texas content. As always, hook on.